namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Welcome back to the class after several cancellations. I have to apologize for the one last week, was it? About 4.30, the snow started to come down. It looked like it was turning into a blizzard. <laughs> and so I thought if we kept the class that people would be driving here through a blizzard, so I thought to cancel it. And then sure enough, by... About 5.30, after all the telephone calls were made, the snow stops, and not more than a quarter of an inch accumulation, and then the sky clears up, and it's a very perfectly beautiful night. It seems my life is getting more and more complicated at the beginning, I used to just come in with just the book. <laughs> then I thought to come in with the book and the polytext, which I would keep on the side and have to open each time. And somebody gave me this thing, which was quite, quite convenient for carrying all of them together. And Peter gave me this book uh, stand, which was very convenient for holding the polytext open. And somebody gave me the recording device, high-tech, so now I have to go through a whole routine of setting everything up when I come in here. Okay, we are continuing now with the Satipatthana Sutta. This is Middle-Length Discourses of the Buddha, Sutta number 10. And we are on the section on contemplation of phenomena or mind objects, dhamma-nupassana. Last time I did the section on the five hindrances on page 151. And now we come to the section on the five aggregates. This is on page 152. Section 38. But before I go into this, just to recapitulate what we've covered so far. Okay, the purpose of this sutta is to show how to develop contemplation on, we call it the domain of experience or the field of experience which has been divided up into four primary domains, prim four primary ranges, domains to which one is to which one is to contemplate with mindful awareness, with mindful attention. This is the body, feelings, then mind, which means, in effect, states of mind. And then these contemplations, these three contemplations, open the field up for the contemplation of dhammas. This means the contempl... I don't agree with the translation here, contemplation of mind objects, but rather I prefer now contemplation of phenomena. So the three, I would say the three prime earlier contemplations having primarily, any one of them can be taken as a primary object of meditation and can be pursued all the ways to the end. But eventually all of the three earlier contemplations converge upon the contemplation of phenomena. And it is when one reaches Dhammanupassana, the contemplation of phenomena, that one really enters into the proper field of 
insight meditation. Even though people sometimes think of doing satipatthana as being practicing vipassana, doing insight meditation, but until one comes to dhammanupassana, one is really doing the preparations for insight meditation. But where insight really properly opens up is when one comes to the contemplation of phenomena. And in order to reach the phenomena that have to be contemplated, in order to clarify the mind so that it becomes a fit instrument of contemplation, it is necessary to overcome the five hindrances, the panchanivarana. And so last time, well, we see this in the actual pattern or sequence of contemplation of phenomena that the text puts the contemplation of the five hindrances at the very beginning. Because in order to be able to pass on to the deeper, more profound contemplations, one has to break through or to overcome, even temporarily, the five hindrances. And as I explained last time, the five hindrances themselves can be made objects of meditation, objects of contemplation. And by doing so, that becomes a means for weakening the power of the five hindrances and ultimately for overcoming them. Okay, and once the five hindrances are suppressed, once the five hindrances subside, then the meditator is able to contemplate very, very clearly, very precisely the nature of mental and physical phenomena. And so in section two, we come to the primary category that the Buddha uses, let's say the primary scheme that the Buddha uses for classifying mental and physical phenomena. This is the scheme that is called the five aggregates, the panchakanda, or in the sutta they're actually called the panchupadhanakanda, which means the five aggregates subject to clinging, the five aggregates that form the objective basis for clinging. Clinging or upadana is the mental activity of, it's an expression of craving, firm, intense craving, insofar as it, insofar as it takes the form of holding to an object, holding to it in order to extract pleasure and enjoyment from it, or holding to the object with wrong views, with wrong understanding. And the five aggregates are set up by the Buddha as a primary scheme of classification because this is it's a very, very systematic way to show us how we hold and grasp to different aspects of our experience and engage in the process of identifying with these aspects of our experience. And when I use the word identifying, what is meant is taking different aspects of our experience different aspects of our existence, bodily and mental existence, taking them to be I, mine, and myself. These are, we call them the three primary obsessions of the subjective way of thinking. We take things to stand in some relation to ourselves, 
these things are mine. Or else we take things to be, at a very subtle level, to be, identif- to be identical with ourselves. This is taking them to be I. Then once we take something to be I, then we build up views, theories, doctrines, systems of belief upon these underlying assumptions. And so we construct doctrines of a self, a soul, an eternal personal identity around these more fundamental notions of I. And so the fundamental, one you could say the fundamental point of the Buddha's teaching is to lead to liberation, to enlightenment through breaking through all of these obsessive involvements with the notions of I, mine, and myself. And in order to help us develop the insight into the selfless nature of phenomena, the Buddha has to show us what are the different aspects of experience, the different phenomena or entities that we grasp upon and cling to with the ideas, this is mine, this is I, this is myself. And so in the very early suttas, we have the scheme developed of the five aggregates. We come across the scheme very often in the Majjhima Nikaya, but if you're not satisfied with the Majjhima Nikaya's treatment of it, then in the Sangyutta Nikaya, we have a whole big chapter of some 200 short suttas, all concerned with the five aggregates. And in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the five aggregates are treated from many, many different angles. But all of those angles, no matter what the starting point might be, they all converge upon the basic realization that these five aggregates are ne tang mama, ne so hamasmi, ne so me atati. This is not mine. This is not I. This is not myself. Okay, a good question. It's a difficult one to answer at length, but I would understand it that the notion I is an idea that arises spontaneously, we can say, and it is not a systematic idea, but it's an idea that just arises in the course of immediate experience. And so just whenever we have experience through the senses, thought, reflection, some idea of I comes into the mind. And just naturally, we take this idea of I to be pointing to to some kind of reality, to be pointing to a real I. Okay, so this is the notion, this is I then we might identify that I with one of, or another of the five aggregates. But now, this is what I think is the difference now. When that notion of I is then taken up by reflective thought and we try to figure out through reflection, what is this I? And we work out some doctrine about the I. Ah, the I must be behind my... The body can't be the I since the body is perishing. The feelings, the thoughts cannot be the I. But there has to be some I there since that I is... The idea of I is always arising. So there's some I behind all of my 
within the body or behind the body, within the thinking process, behind the thinking process, then one comes to consider this I, does it last forever or does it perish? Then some will come to the notion the I depends upon the body. When the body dies, the I is finished. That becomes the called the view of the annihilationism, the view of, or materialism, the view of a self that perishes with the death of the body. Others will have the view that there is, that I is an eternal entity. It will last forever. So this is the view of a self, a, a lasting self, an everlasting self. Then some will come to the idea is this eternal self, is it universal, is it individual, is it boundless, is it finite, Um, does it have form, does it not have form, and then they'll develop different theories, views about the self. So that I understand to be the views about the self. Okay, now we'll just take the text of the passage in the sutta and then I'll give elaboration of it. Here we're in paragraph 38. Again, bhikkhus, monks, a bhikkhu abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena in terms of the five aggregates affected by or subject to clinging. And how does he do so? Here, a bhikkhu understands such is material form, such its origin, such its disappearance, such is feeling, such its origin, such its disappearance, such is perception, such its origin, such its disappearance, such are the volitional formations, such their origins, such their disappearance, such as consciousness, such its origin, such its disappearance. In this way, he dwells contemplating phenomena as phenomena internally, externally, and both internally and externally, and he dwells independent, not clinging to anything in the world, and so on. Okay, so here... I'll take the explanation in different layers. First, we'll take the aggregates themselves before we come to their origin and disappearance. Okay, the aggregate of material form or rupa. This is, comprises, the word aggregate (coughs) means a totality. And so the word rupa, uh, the word rupa kanda, the aggregate of form, means whatever material form there might be. In the usual formula, it can be past, present, future, internal, that is pertaining to oneself, or external, the bodies, the form and the bodies of other beings, also inanimate at matter. The matter that makes up physical objects is also in the Rupa Kanda. Internal or external, it can be superior, inferior, far, near. All of this is included in the form aggregate. Okay, then there's a sutta which explains the characteristics of the aggregate. <clears throat> and so what is the characteristic of the form aggregate? The Buddha raise, the Sutta raises the question, why is it called form? And here there's a word play in the Pali, which in today's language we would say, if somebody were to use this explanation, we would say, 
poor joke. <laughs> okay, why is it called Rupa? Then the answer is given. Rupati, which might be translated, it might have been translated, it is injured or troubled. But I tried to carry through the play on words by translating it, it is deformed. You see, in Pali, the word rupati really doesn't have anything to do etymologically with the word rupa. They're just two completely independent words. But the text introduces this play on words trying to derive the word rupa form from a verb rupati, which means to be afflicted, to be troubled, to be injured. And so, what is it, or in other words, I, I, I render it deformed. By what is it deformed? It is deformed by heat, cold, sun, wind. Then it goes on by mosquitoes, flies, serpents, creeping things and so on. Hunger and thirst. Okay, so for this this reason, it is called form. Okay, and what is the contents? What makes up the form aggregate? Here, a text gives the explanation. It is the four great elements and any form derived from the four great elements. What are the four great elements? Yeah. Right. Okay, so we have the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. So these are the primary elements in Buddhist philosophy. And now we might think these four elements are just sort of mythological concepts. But actually these four elements, according to the Abhidharma way of explanation, represent four, I call them, behavioral properties of matter. So the earth element, we could say, is the solid aspect of matter, the aspect of matter that provides resistance. The, what's called the water element, the liquid element, is the cohesive aspect of matter, what causes matter to bind together. The fire element, of course, is the energy aspect the heat aspect. And the air element is the mobile aspect, the aspect of expansion and contraction. And then it's based upon these four great elements, which according to Buddhist philosophy, they are present in Every particle of matter has these four elements. So even this piece of chalk, in this piece of chalk, the earth element is predominant. But there's also the liquid element, which causes it to bind together, to cohere together. There is heat element, because the chalk has some heat. And there is the wind element, the air element. Though we don't see the air element, it's not visible. But if we were to look at it through a very high-powered microscope, we would see particles in constant motion. That motion is the manifestation 
of the air element. Is that also the space? Space is what is not the air element. Space is a fifth element. That space is, we call it the empty space between the units of the four great elements. Okay, then, based upon the four great elements, there are different types that we call derived matter, secondary matter, like, for example, the sense faculties, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, the sensory qualities like colors, smells, tastes, Then different properties of matter like sexual differentiation, the nutritive property of matter. These are considered form derived from the great elements. And I should mention that in the suttas, no explanation is given of form derived from the great elements. The phrase is used but not explained. Explanation comes in the Abhidhamma Different Abhidhamma systems, Theravada, Savastivada, give somewhat, in detail, somewhat different explanations. So this seems to have been an area which was not precisely defined in the very early stage of Buddhist thought, but came to be filled in over the generations. Okay, I'm going to jump over to the simile because I want to leave the conditions for later. Then the simile, each of the five aggregates has its own simile. The simile for illustrating the aggregate of form, this one sutta called pain, Painupinda Sutta, the lump of foam is the name of the sutta. It's Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 22, Sutta 95. It gives similes for each of the five aggregates. And so the Buddha here uses a simile. Suppose a lump of foam were floating down the Ganges River. The Buddha was now on the bank of the Ganges River together with the monks. And he says, I think he pointed to a lump of foam, and he says, do you see, O monks, that lump of foam floating down the Ganges River. The monks say, yes, sir. Then the Buddha says, if with keen eyes, a person with keen eyes were to look at that lump of foam and inspect it closely, examine it very, very closely, he would find that it is empty, hollow, void. And so the Buddha says, in the same way, form is like a lump of foam. If you examine form closely, examine it with wise attention, very carefully, one will find that it is empty, hollow, and void. (laughs) And so this actually corresponds (laughs) very, very closely to what physicists say today, that If you take the matter within an atom, we think of even the atom, we used to depict it as like little billiard balls, but now the scientists depict the atom. The nucleus is like you have a football field. The nucleus might be like maybe a big basketball at the center of the field and the electrons might be like little flies buzzing around in the stands and the rest of (laughs) the atom is empty, void. But when these particles come together through their binding force, they give rise to the impression of 
solidity, substantiality. But when one examines it with high tech, highly technological instruments, one finds <laughs> that matter is mostly empty space. And so the body too, physical form of our own bodies, is the same way just like a lump of foam. Okay, then we come to the aggregate of feeling. This is Vedana. And feeling here, uh, maybe I should ask at this point after explaining form, are there any questions about form not relating to conditionality of form? Any questions on anything I explain? If somebody is a physicist, please don't contradict my <laughs> poor knowledge of physics. Yes? No, it's comment, it's a question. Um, I'm, I'm understanding this to mean that form is, is being defined as that which is acted on by form. That it's stuff that's being acted on by itself. You have, like, you, you have the example here that form is that which is deformed by... The things that act that are acting on form are also instances of form, yeah. I, mean, I guess my question is, do they also describe form as being acted on by, let's say, the next form, feeling, or, or any of the other aggregates? Or is it defined to be... Um, it's acted upon by the other aggregates, but this verb rupati is used only in relation to things that are also instances of form. I think because here, (laughs) another play on words, the text brings in a standard formula (laughs) for explaining what is acting upon form. And these are things, this is a formula of things that can cause trouble or difficulties to a person. Heat and cold, hunger and thirst, the sun and wind, and series up of these are creeping things, serpents. And in, in the example that you just gave, hunger is, a, is considered also part of the result, or is it part of Well, it's something that if it's not really treated analytically, it's just mentioned, but it's not analyzed into one of the aggregates. Hunger actually would be we don't have to say it's a complex phenomenon in terms of the aggregates. It involves the body, but also mental components. It's just without a mind, the body without a mind would not experience hunger. And the definition that's given, this is more for the purpose of conveying some sense of what it means to have a body. It's not intended to be an analytical, philosophical explanation to be subjected to this treatment, are these things form or not form? One instance of something else that acts upon form will come to a little later when we come to the fourth aggregate. Okay, then I'll go on now to continue with feeling. Okay, by feeling, Vedana is meant not emotion, but we call it the simple of I use the word affective quality of experience. This is with an A, not with an E. That is the nature of experience, how we experience things. Whether we experience things as being pleasant, basic th- basically three different modalities in which we can experience things as being pleasant, and that is pleasant feeling, as being painful, that is painful feeling, or else we experience them without any prominent pleasant or painful feeling, in which case we experience them with neither painful nor pleasant feeling. So those are three basic. We could have feelings distinguished by way of their, I call it modality, as pleasant, 
painful and neutral feelings. But another way of distinguishing feelings, analyzing them, is in terms of their place of origin, where they originate from. And in this, when we take this approach, then we come to six types of feeling. Feeling which arises through contact. Let's say feeling which is born of contact through the eye. Feeling which is born of contact through the ear. Feeling born of contact through the nose, tongue, body. And then there's class of feelings which is born of contact that takes place purely internally without reference to an external sense base. And so the field of experience broken down in terms of the six sense bases is experienced in different ways. as pleasant, painful, and neutral. And each of the sense bases experiences its own class of objects in these three ways. Okay, then the simile to illustrate feeling, we have the simile of a water bubble. Here the Buddha uses the illustration, suppose it is raining and there's been a certain puddle has been forming in the, in a hole in the ground, the hole fills up with water and then the heavy rain is hitting the puddle or the pool of water. And as the rain hits the pool of water, each time it hits, a water bubble arises and bursts, arises and bursts. So the Buddha says, in the same way, feeling should be considered like a water bubble. That is because feelings are constantly arising and breaking up even though we seem to be experiencing the same feeling, what might be a persisting pleasure or a persisting pain. But if one examines that feeling with very fine attention, we will see that this feeling is just, what what seems to be a persisting feeling is actually a continuum (laughs) of momentary feelings, each of which arises and breaks, arises and breaks, just like the water bubbles. Okay, any question on feeling? Okay, then we move on to what is called, what is translated here as perception, or Pali word sanya. Sanya is the particular function of mind, or mental function, that selects and identifies the features of the objective field. Perception is what focuses upon the qualities of objects. Perception is what 
they identifies objects as being of particular types. Perception is responsible for the different conceptual schemes that we use for understanding our experience. So Sanya actually has quite a wide range, beginning from the most elementary types, the most primitive types of bare perception, all the way up to the most complex types of, say, mental conceptual conceptual operations. The sutta, which gives the analysis of the five aggregates, it just gives, it hardly doesn't really give an explanation of perception, but it just gives an illustration. It says, it perceives, why is it called perception? It perceives, it perceives, therefore it is called perception. But that itself is significant. It perceives, it perceives. In other words, this particular mental function or mental factor perception is being defined in terms of its action. It's not so much an entity, but an operation of the mind. So it is that operation of perceiving, that activity of perceiving. And then just some examples are given. It perceives blue, yellow, red, white. This is an example of perception, visual perception. Is it that first moment of recognition or naming or something? The moment of recognition, this is a good point. The first moment of recognition is also a function of perception. Perception has many aspects. So this is the point that I should should make. Perception initially identifies things, and by identifying, that serves as a basis for recognition. And so, for example, if I'm introduced to somebody, a person for the first time, I've never seen this person before, then when I see this person, I perceive certain aspects of that person's appearance. The hair might be of a certain color, certain shape, certain facial features, certain way of walking, and so on. So these are different acts of perception. Then maybe a week later, two weeks or later, I'm traveling in a train or on a bus. Somebody sits down next to me. I look and look at the face, the hair, and that's the person I met last week, that recognition is coming about, that recognition itself is an operation of perception, and that operation of perception of recognition is possible because of the perceptions that took place on the first occasion when I met that person. But as soon as you form the concept that this is the person I met last week, you're, you're out of perception, right? Aren't you still beginning to sound far at that point? Let us say all of the aggregates actually occur at the same time. You can't select one aggregate and say this is occurring at one time, this at another. But when one has to say what one has to say is, what is the aggregate which is performing the dominant function on that occasion? So I would say when one is recognizing the person as being the person one has met the previous week, that act of recognition is an activity of sanya, of perception. I say within that act of recognition, sanya is the dominant factor. It is sanya, perception, that is responsible. It enables one to identify the particular face, the particular bodily gestures that one is seeing 
now on the bus with the particular face, bodily gestures that one saw a week ago. Okay, now perception, though we give visual examples, but that's only because in human beings, vision is the most prominent type of perception. If this were a class of dogs, we would be using smells as as examples of perception. If it were a class of Birds, we might be using sounds. <laughs> so we have six classes of perception according to the objective domains perception of forms, perception of sounds, perception of odors, perception of taste, perception of tactile sensations. If it were a class of Insects, I think they get along predominantly by tactile sensations. So if I were a caterpillar teaching the five aggregates to a class of caterpillars, I would speak about different types of tactile sensations. In human beings, tactile sensations are subsidiary. This is rough. This is smooth. This is Rough and smooth, that's pretty much what we have. (laughs) This is grainy, this is... And then their perception of mental phenomena, perception of ideas. Okay, then a simile is given. The Buddha uses the simile of somebody who is traveling through a desert and then sees in the desert a mirage, a shimmering mirage. We have this, you don't have to give the example of a desert, but often when we're you're driving on a hot day, it's very dry on the road, you see ahead what looks like a pool of water, but then when you come to it, no water is there. The people traveling through the desert is a better example because they're very thirsty and they see this mirage of an oasis of water. They think they'll go to drink when they are The further they go, the mirage is always receding towards the horizon. So this is a good example for the delusive nature of so much of perception, particularly because, according to the Buddha, it is the delusions, delusions that insert themselves into perception that sustain ignorance, ignorance being the primary obstacle to enlightenment and liberation. And so it's particularly these delusions of permanence, of some kind of lasting pleasure, and particularly of selfhood that give us this, that constantly fuel craving, clinging, and grasping. And so perception is like a mirage, constantly displaying things as having some kind of substantiality, some kind of solidity, some kind of offering some kind of permanent pleasure. But this permanence, this substantiality, this pleasure is just a delusion, a mirage. Okay, then... Okay, any questions now about perception?
Okay, now we come to the fourth aggregate, which is called the Sankara Kanda. This is the aggregate of voli- I, I use the translation now, volitional formations. And the Sankara Kanda is a very broad category. It includes but it includes especially the most prominent component within this aggregate are the six classes of volition. The word volition here, this is in Pali, it's chaitana. And volition is again, like perception, differentiated by way of its object. There are volitions, intentions, purposes regarding each of the six types of objects. I deliberately kept off the explanation of the word until I gave the explanation of the contents because it's a little obscure. In the Pali, it reads much, much nicer. No translation could render this explanation. So I write the Pali, or I'll state the Pali. Sankatang api sankarongti ti tasma sankarati vuchanti If I want to give the translation that reproduced the play on words in the original, it would be something like they construct the constructed. Therefore, they are called constructing. Constructings. But that doesn't wouldn't sound too good as a translation. <laughs> okay, so sankatang is what is formed or what is construct, what is conditioned, and these things, the sankharas, the volitional formations, shape the conditioned, build them up. give rise to them, make them what they are. That is why they are called volitional formations. So the point of this is that our volitional activities are what shape alter and modify all the other aggregates. So, our volitional activities give rise to the body. Our body, we can say, is built up by our volitional activities from one life to the next. The body in any life comes into being through the volitional activities, the karmic activities of the previous life. And then in the course of a lifetime, our volitional activities continually shape the body. For example, in other words, they're shaping form. 
if I decide to speak, then that volitional formation of wanting to speak causes nerve currents to start acting, the vocal cords to vibrate, the mouth to open and close, and words come out. The volitional formations shape feeling. According to our intentions, our purposes, our feelings change. Our volitions act upon our perceptions. So, a person who has one type of purpose will perceive things in terms of that purpose. So, somebody, say, who maybe his whole purpose in life is to get rich, to earn money. So, he might be traveling through a very beautiful countryside, maybe traveling on a train or bus through a beautiful countryside. There might be fantastic views of mountains, rivers, and he's reading the financial pages of the newspaper. (laughs) Somebody else whose intention is maybe a painter is traveling through the countryside and he's looking at the scenery and he's absorbing the scenery with the idea of getting inspiration for a painting. <laughs> and so the, you could say the volitional formations are affecting perception. There's a famous saying, when a pickpocket sees a saint, all he sees is his pocketbook. <laughs> Okay, then the simile to illustrate volitional formations, the Buddha gives the simile of a person who needs to make some object like a piece of furniture, a table, a chair, goes into the woods, finds a good, sturdy, big banana tree, thinks, I'll be able to get some real solid wood out of this, cuts down the banana tree and starts peeling off the coils, thinking, once I peel off the coils, I'll come to the heartwood inside. Peels off one coil, another coil, another coil, till finally peels off all the coils and what does he come to? Nothing. (laughs) He finds the trunk of the banana tree, it's empty, hollow, void. And so in the same way, the Buddha says, when one examines these volitional formations, peels them off one after another, looking what behind, within them, behind them, is there the true self in there? One keeps on going after, going through one after another after another of these volitional formations. And one never comes to any solid core of personal identity. Nothing that can be taken as one's true self. Yeah. Question of volitional formation, but I have difficulty understanding this. It was volitional, I think, an intention and a mental action. Mental. Yeah. And so that, I think of volitional formation as a mental construct. Uh, mm. So, but a, a mental formation is not correct. Is it a special class of a mental formation? Yeah, mental formation, volitional formation, this is a sort of makeshift English word that 
earlier translators coined, I'm following suit here, though I replace mental formation with volitional formations. Okay, these are... You see, the word formation suggests something that is formed. But what is really intended here are things, activities that do the forming or shaping. And the point seems to be that it is our intentions or volitions that have this formative influence, this shaping influence upon so many aspects of our lives. First, what's immediately visible, the volitions shape the other four aggregates according to their own natures, their own tendencies. And also, in terms of the process of rebirths from one life to the next, (coughs) these volitional activities shape the onward movement of the process of rebirth. They bring about the new... That's what sort of gives shape to the new forms of existence that follow one after another. Does that help to make it clearer? Okay. (laughs) Okay, then we come to the fifth aggregate, consciousness. Okay, the word consciousness comes vinyana. It comes from the stem is jnana, which means knowing, and v. The exact function of that is not quite clear. I would say it has some kind of discriminative or specializing function. The text, I have to say, is not particularly helpful. <laughs> In fact, it's a little puzzling or perplexing. It says, why is it called vinyana? Uh, actually, it should be it cognizes, not they cognize. It cognizes. What does it, what does it cognize? It cognizes sour, bitter, sweet, salty, and so on. This raises more questions than it solves and it answers since one would ask, well, if perception is distinguished by perceiving color, what is the difference really between consciousness and perception? It can't be the case. Perception just perceives color. Consciousness cognizes taste. Certainly there's perceiving of taste. There's being conscious of colors. So... This example of way of explanation is not so helpful. And the texts don't give what I would call the kind of philosophical explanation of vinyana, of consciousness, that we would be accustomed to, say, from courses in psychology or philosophy. Usually they just give explanations by examples. But from what I've been able to see, the way I would understand it, vinyana is, well, let's take the important point is that vinyana, consciousness, in contrast to perception, consciousness is distinguished into six classes by way of the sense base, the sense faculty, through which it arises. We have eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousness. And so, now the way I would understand consciousness, as I understand consciousness, the function of consciousness is to serve as, I call it, the light of Awareness, again, that's a vague word, that illuminates, that arises based on a particular sense faculty 
and illuminates a particular objective field through that sense faculty. So we have awareness arising through the eye and illuminating forms through the eye. Let's say illuminating the entire domain of forms through the eye. And then perception, sanya, would be we say has a selective function, a more discriminative function. Perception is what fixes upon particular aspects of the visual field and identifies them, labels them, (laughs) conceives them. Similarly, ear consciousness is the basic awareness that arises through the ear faculty and illuminates the field, the domain of sounds. It makes the whole domain of sounds accessible to our experience, within our experience, to our awareness. But perception of sounds would be the function, the mental function of seizing upon selecting certain sounds and identifying them. That's the sound of my friend's voice. That's the sound of a particular bird. That's the sound of my dog barking as I pull into the driveway. That's the sound of a song that I heard years ago and now I'm hearing it again for the first time in 30 years. This is the best I can do. (laughs) Okay, then the simile used to illustrate consciousness is that of a magician who at a crossroads, I think this must have been a regular occurrence in India, set up a stand, sets up a stand, and performs a magical show. And crowd gathers, the magician will take pieces of some stones, pieces of straw, pieces of sticks, recites some mantras, weaves the hands around, back, forward, like this, and zoom, Everybody sees an elephant appears on the stage. (laughs) But if somebody comes up close and says, is there really an elephant there? Looks very closely, examines that illusion. Maybe somebody is behind the magician, standing behind. They'll see that the magician actually had very, very fine, subtle silk scroll hidden up his sleeve. And while he's chanting the mantras and performing these subtle gestures, he was actually pulling that scroll out little by little from his sleeve. And then when he goes, zoom, the lighting is such that it falls onto that scroll And there are little hooks coming down from the ceiling. He hooks the scroll onto, he catches the hook, the scroll onto the hooks. And the lights illuminate the scroll so that it creates the appearance. Everybody is going, wow, an elephant, an elephant. And the magician says, see, I turn sticks, stones, grass into an elephant. 
<laughs> but somebody comes up close, or sneaks up behind the magician and watches what is he doing, and he finds out it's all the deceptive illusion, just sheer trickery. And so that is the nature of consciousness. Consciousness conjures up this whole picture and story of our lives, loves, hates, this is my country, this is my country's enemies, this is my family, this is other families, this is my property, not your, that's your property, this is my career, my bank account, all of this is fabricated within the field of consciousness. And it's all the magical illusion brought up by consciousness. Okay, so this is the explanation of consciousness, the aggregate of consciousness. Any questions about this? Well, those examples you just gave, those aren't sankaras, those are... Well... <laughs> those are slightly different from a light of awareness. Don't hold me too, <laughs> too literally to it in detail. I was having a lot of fun with that simile. <laughs> you can't make a nice simile out of light of awareness. <laughs> Well, I would say <laughs> it's the light of awareness. Let us call the consciousness is that light that illuminates the magic show and lights up the screen, the scroll that makes the elef- that makes it appear to be a real elephant on the stage. If you want to carry the analogy through. Yes. That's the light of awareness. Then how sati is it? What's the function of consciousness comes together, the eye and yeah. the visual, the object yeah. come together and you have eye consciousness. Yeah. So eye consciousness is the light of awareness shining on. Yeah. So what's sati is that knows the... I, I, this always baffles me. Okay. If that's awareness. Maybe we could leave that question because I haven't yet come to the actual contemplation of the five aggregates. So we could leave that for. I have to come to that next week. So we'll leave that for next week. But just any question pertaining just to what I've covered on the five aggregates, not launching into new territory. Um, yeah. Something I just noticed about the five aggregates is. They almost seem to be in a particular order. Yeah. Consciousness is sort of out of that order. The form is... Consciousness is... Seems to then be out of that order. Mm. If you look at um, the first form, it sort of goes from like m- most basic to a more built-up construct. You start with form, yeah. which is just this raw, there it is, form, yeah. and feeling is something that comes about because yeah. of form, and then the perception is a more built-up idea yeah. about what we're feeling, and yeah. then you know, volitional formations are, are a bigger, com- a more complex construct than yeah. that. It almost seems like, but then consciousness always comes at the end of the list, and when we discuss its function, it always yeah. is right up there, right at the beginning of the process. Yeah, what I would say is that the, in fact, this is what is said in the Visuddhimagga, the compendium of Buddhist, early Buddhist philosophy, that the aggregates are listed in this order because of, it's the order of increasing subtlety or difficulty to discern. So form, material form is something gross, coarse. Feeling in the sense of experiences of pleasure, pain are readily um, comprehensible. Perceptions, at least the sensory perceptions, readily comprehensible. The volitional formations, the intentions, 
are somewhat more subtle. But that awareness is something very, very subtle. So they're not in the order of like, how they occur in the process, but in how we come to see them. That is right. As I said a short while ago, they all occur together. I'm going to go through over that a little more next week. Just now, I'll just take questions relating to the actual explanation of the five aggregates themselves. In fact, it's really time to stop unless there's an urgent question. Okay, then we will stop with the sharing, end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merit with the deities, the spirits, and all beings asking them to rejoice in this merits. And particularly now, this is a time when we have had very severe catastrophe in South, Southeast Asia. Let us share the merits, especially this Dhamma that we are studying has come, been transmitted for many centuries through from India to Sri Lanka. So let us share the merit with all beings who have been adversely affected by this calamity and asking the devas and buddhas to protect all beings in this world and especially to spare those beings, people who have been adversely affected from any further adversity. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva nagamahitika Punyantang anumodiva chirang rakantu sasanang akasa ta chabuma ta deva nagamahitika punyantang anumodiva chirang rakantu de sanang akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumodiva Chirang Rakantu Mangparang Etavata Cham Mehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Anumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhya Etavata chaham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe bhuta numodantu sabha sampati siddhya etavata chaham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata numodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhiyah.